today we're fortunate enough to have John Bloom, as well as uh, Alex and Daniel, who Alex is here, and Daniel's in Mountain View. Is that true? And is that okay? Great. I'm seeing some <laughs> some movement from some physical yep. forms. Uh, that's really great. Oh, and uh, uh, just a very brief intro. John and I have known each other for for quite some time through a couple different ways. Um, John is a uh, a former topologist. Um, I think he's going to make that known in this talk uh, and now works at the Broad Institute and he really is sitting right between the worlds of kind of statistics and machine learning and biology. There's not a lot of people like him and like his kind of co-conspirators on this talk and I think what they're working on is really interesting and let's waste no more time and, and, and let him get into it. Awesome. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, walk across I guess, Ames Street, yes. to, uh, Literally to join you guys today. Uh, just to give a little sense of where I'm coming from, uh, I walked across another street about, uh, well, almost four years ago now, maybe three and a half years. Uh, so on the left is MIT. I was in the math department as a postdoc. And on the right is uh, the Broad Institute, those two buildings. Uh, I even made an animation. <laughs> <laughs> that is the fanciest thing in my talk. <laughs> uh, and also, I hope I don't get sued for using the Google Pet Band. <laughs> but anyway, uh, out the road, uh, I, I uh, well, like, I got a Blackboard. That's the only Blackboard uh, in the Institute. <laughs> and that's Cotton Seed on the right, Alex Wimond on the left. And Cotton and I, uh, when we got there, started a team. It's called Hale. And he's the lead of the team. We've now grown to about 10, 10 smiling people. And essentially, what I've been up to the last few years is writing code to uh, accomplish the following. So in, in principle, with all this data, we should do computational experiments. And you'd like computational biologists to spend most of their time thinking about what are the models that we'll learn from this data and spend a little bit of time implementing and running those models. But our data is growing 3 to 5x per year. And so this is more like the reality. Uh, and so to solve that problem, uh, we're doing a lot of the things you guys do, building distributed systems, compilers, uh, and so on, uh, to to build something like structured tensors and and let the computational biologists sit on top and work at a high level of abstraction. So that's that's sort of my main job. Uh, but I have a hobby, and it's this seminar. Uh, it's called Models, Inference, and Algorithms. This was the very first session that happened on the second floor. Uh, I don't know if people can recognize that handsome fellow in the front. He's talking about neural nets to a bunch of computational biologists. Uh, he is now at Brain. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I would say in the early days, actually, we had a lot of interaction with some really wonderful uh, machine learners. You can see in this picture Matt Johnson, Alex, Jasper. Uh, there's David Kelly in the back. Uh, Dougal's on the side, Ryan Adams. Um, they are now, uh, you know, we inspired them to go on to great things. Uh, here, are the, here are the rest chefs, uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to get you here. Yeah, we have a few visitors here, and um, oh, uh, but Alex, Alex is still at Broad, and uh, and she's in this room, and she's one of the four people uh, together. We worked on this paper, and I would say it's a little disappointing to me that I, you can't see me because I really talk with my body and my hands. Um, about these ideas. Uh, but if you want to see that performance, there are two videos, a primer and a main talk with the four of us. You can do them online. Uh, if you go to the resources, I'll send you at the end. All right, so here's the outline for uh, what I'm going to tell you about today. So at the Broad, our mission is really about, uh, well, curing diseases and understanding biology to do so. Uh, and of course, when we are collecting lots of data, machine learning becomes an important part of that. But we still want to start with the, the problem, sort of with the nail rather than the hammer. And this work really grew out of starting with a, uh, a biological problem. Uh, and I'll tell you what that is and where it led, which will take us through some ideas of uh, applying topology to think about the nature of PCA itself as a learning algorithm. Then we'll discuss uh, linear autoencoders and, in particular, what happens when you add L2 regularization. And then I'll try to conclude with a few ideas of potential research programs, maybe points of contact and collaboration that would be fun to continue to discuss if the ideas are interesting. And if they're not, well, then we'll have to think of some new ideas. <laughs> Great. So this is the biological problem last summer we were thinking about. And by we, I mean Cotton, Alex, and I were, were thinking about uh, single cell RNA expression data. 
And so this is really a matrix uh, where the rows are genes, the columns are cells, those are your observations. The entries count how many RNA molecules for that gene did you find in that cell. And this is really cool data because you can cluster it and learn about cell type in a way that took hundreds of years under microscopes. Now you can actually begin to understand the you know, development of cells, the you know, anatomy physiology, you can understand them in terms of the molecules the cells contain and the programs that the genes are enacting. And so at a high level, this is the problem of learning the programming language of the cell, right? How is the cell acting like a little computer and responding to its environment? And how does that change over time? So we had an idea to uh, apply a model that was to us a little more satisfying than an autoencoder to the dimensional reduction task, sort of representation learning on cells. And the idea was to do a sort of matrix autoencoder uh, with the structure you see on the screen. So we have that matrix in the upper left of data. There are, there's a row encoder and a column encoder, which conceptually should give you factors, which are like cell type and gene modules. And then we wanted a kind of form that brings together these two representations to try to recapitulate the entry from the representation that's learned simultaneously for cells and genes. And sort of mathematically for uh, you know, the three of us with PhDs in that area on this project, this idea of having the duality between rows and columns and really thinking about learning both the representations of these objects, but also of the morphism or the map from the objects or relationship between them, those were ideas that we were excited about to do that all in one go. Uh, and so when we first did this, our, our G was actually just the dot product of two k-dimensional representations. And we tried really hard to put fancy uh, encoders in for F1 and F2 um, for maybe a week. And no matter what we did, we couldn't beat SVD. And uh, that was upsetting until we realized that we were being silly. So any ideas why we could not beat SVD? So our loss function here is just the squared error between the reconstruction and the uh, original matrix. SVD is correct. correct. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So we were thwarted, thwarted by the Eckert-Young theorem from 1936. You Unfortunately, you? none of us were alive back then, so we just didn't know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so we had some choices. Uh, we could either upgrade our bilinear form to something sort of nonlinear, and we, and we played with that, and we could create something competitive with deep matrix factorization techniques that exist, and there's lots of ways to extend it and a lot to explore. But we got a bit sidetracked partway through the summer, uh, and we went mostly with option two, which led to this work, which was to obsess over the interpretability of the linear representations that you would learn from SVD. It's a quick question. Do you have any missing values in the matrix? No. Uh, the matrix does have a bunch of zeros, but it's a very, but they're not missing. They're true zero. Oh, no, they're observed zeros. Okay. Wait, so, okay. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> great. So, uh, great. So, we went on option two um, in part because, uh, you know, from the perspective of understanding something about biology, we would like latent representations that mean something to us biologically. It would be wonderful if the coordinates were actually biologically meaningful not just the low dimensional manifold that hangs out near the data. And so uh, when we were thinking about this, just in the context of a linear autoencoder, it was clear pretty much on its face that what that learns, I mean, everyone sort of, this is the folklore and you can prove it, it's not very hard, right? It learns the orthogonal projection of uh, PCA, right? And it learns that in the original feature space. So you start with a cell represented, say, as a vector across 20,000 genes, and you're gonna get some projection to another 20,000 dimensional representation, which is on a k-plane sitting inside 20,000 dimensional space. That's an orthogonal projection. So its eigenvalues are zero and one, and there is no preferred basis in particular for either subspace. And the representation that you're learning in k-dimensions, say you're using 20 factors, right? That guy is only defined up to an arbitrary invertible linear map. And that's what I'm showing in this uh, picture that I made at about 3 a.m. last night. <laughs> so um, here we have our autoencoder. We have our data matrix X. It has M rows and N observations. Those are the columns. W1's our encoder. W2's our decoder. And our loss function is measuring X minus W2, W1X, Frobenius norm squared, right? Just the Euclidean squared distance to uh, between the low rank approximation and the data. Yeah. I just want to point out that like, you're, so you're talking about the the autoencoder as like as an objective function, but there's also the fact that we train the autoencoder with something like gradient descent, 
and you know you're not going to recover the global optimum because it's like a so in this case you will a linear autoencoder has a unique minimum up to this symmetry but linear linear autoencoder there's like a unique SPC solution to pca like, up to this symmetry isn't pca like a non-convex optimization problem uh yes. the loss function is non-convex however the minima are a connected compact flat manifold that is unique up to an action of the general linear group of k by k invertible matrices all of them are at the same height. So these are all equally valid minima. And it's not unique in the exact sense that I'm describing here. There's an action of the group of invertible transformations in the representation sure, space. Yeah. And so we don't actually learn in the middle of this autoencoder a unique representation. In but particular, what you're asking is we have kind of decoupled the problem of what can a linear autoencoder learn and the dynamics of the learning algorithm that you would actually deploy to learn that. Sure. Right. Yeah, and there might be all sorts of extra yes. regularization that comes totally from the, stopping yeah. would be probably yeah, exactly. similar. Yeah, yeah, so nothing, we're not even talking about the algorithm. I'm just saying abstractly, we have a loss function. Its minima have a certain form. It's what's given, yeah. right? And, and But it's not unique. And it's not unique in exactly this sense uh, because you could take the encoder and then post-compose it with any invertible matrix G inverse and then pre-compose the decoder with G. And if you take that product, you get back the same W, G, W, 1, right? Um, so this action is interesting. It, it would be simpler if it was a free action, meaning it, it, it sort of like um, just shuffled things around. But, but it actually, uh, you know, if you think about what is the critical landscape, it turns out that the origin, zero, zero, those zero matrices are actually a critical points, a saddle, and that action doesn't move that anywhere, right? And so what you're actually getting are critical manifolds of various dimensions due to this symmetry action. And uh, but there is one nice property that holds, which is that all critical points, uh, whether it's a minimum or any other index, uh, you have the property that W1 and W2 are pseudo inverses. Okay. Okay, but we're still pretty unsatisfied because we're not learning the principal directions, right? We're not learning the picture in the plane of our data that has beautiful clusters, and we move on from there. So. Uh, I think we kind of bifurcated in the project at this point because I I thought of it in one language and um, and maybe Cotton as well and then and then I would say Alex and Daniel were more used to thinking of it in a in a in a different language which is closer to the machine learning and statistics point of view of PCA because we never studied topology yeah <laughs> right so so um, right I, the talk we filmed at Broad I actually uh, sent the link to my NSF supervisor for my postdoc there Tom Rufka and he wrote me back he's like oh. I, I, I finally could sit through a PCA talk. I now know what it means. <laughs> and I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. But he was kind of serious. He's like, now I understand it. And the point of view that he understood is what I'm about to present. And this will be, um, I'm going to try to present it in a way that where you can't see me and the things I'm doing with my hands. Um, but uh, well, you can watch the video that, from the other talk. So uh, let's do our best. All right, we want to think about uh, the problem of principal components analysis. So what is that problem? If we, if we imagine, just to simplify things, that we'll shift our data to be mean-centered, we want to find the k-dimensional subspace to the origin that is closest to our data, and closest in the sense of the sum of squares of the distance from the points to the plane, right? And so often in, uh, in math, we like to use Euclidean space because it's easy to put in a computer and uh, you know, we can think about Rn. It's just a tuple of real numbers. Um, but one thing that happens often is that Euclidean space, representing things in coordinates or choosing some representation with a lot of symmetries or that could be overparameterized, isn't necessarily the most um, elegant or intuitive perspective on the problem. And you can clarify what's going on by moving to the space, which is more natural to the problem at hand. An example would be if you try to take a map of the globe, but a two-dimensional map, that's Euclidean, but it's really hard to measure distances. If you think about the globe, you're not making all these arbitrary choices of how to project, and it's sort of the essence of the surface of the Earth, right? So I want to argue that the natural space of this problem is uh, a manifold called the Grossmannian. So the Grossmannian of k planes in n-dimensional space is what it sounds like as a set its points are k-dimensional subspaces, so planes to the origin in m-dimensional space. The simplest version is to think about lines in the plane through the origin, right? And if you think about lines through the origin, it's a set, but it's also clearly has some sort of topology or continuity because you can make sense of the idea that one line is near another line, right? 
And, and oh, how many dimensions is that manifold? Well, you could start with the x-axis and then start rotating the angle. And after 180 degrees, you're back where you started. So there's sort of one degree of freedom. And you go for a while, you get back where you started. So it's a circle. It's the only closed uh, connected one manifold. And that's also called the real projective line. And that will be our space in the case of looking at uh, one principal component or direction in for data that's in R2. Yeah. And, and so I put two lines here. Uh, the, the red line would be the top principal direction. The, the uh, blue one would be the, the bottom principal direction for this data. Uh, but we really want to think about all the lines through the origin. So now let me convince you that that's a manifold in a, and a smooth manifold, even one that has a, a metric on it, um, by embedding it inside a high dimensional Euclidean space. And then I'll just declare that it inherits a notion of distance through geodesics defined by what it inherits from being in Euclidean space. Okay? And so to do that, what we can recognize is that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between a k-plane in m-dimensional space and the orthogonal projection of rank k onto that k-plane in m-dimensional space. If I tell you the k-plane, you can define there's a unique orthogonal projection and vice versa. And so, you know, formally, those orthogonal projections are m by m matrices, which satisfy that they're projections, so p equals p squared that the orthogonal, which turns out to be equal p equal p transpose, so that the null space and the image are orthogonal, and then the rank condition, which is the trace is k. All right, and that cuts out a set, but that's actually a manifold. And like I said, you can map the projection p to its image to go left, right to left. If you take a basis for the subspace, you can map it to the hat matrix on the right. That will be the orthogonal projection onto the image. It doesn't depend on the basis you chose. That is our identification, and through that identification, we have now bestowed the Grassmannian with the structure of a smooth Riemannian manifold. Okay. So that's our first sort of setup, is that is the natural space of the problem of PCA. Um, the next tool we're going to bring in is called Morse theory. And Morse theory, the central idea is that you can study the shape of a space by thinking about smooth functions to the real numbers on that space. In particular, looking at the critical points and also gradient trajectories that relate those critical points. And so a Morse function is one where all the critical points are non-degenerate, which means that the Hessian is non-singular, right? There are no zero eigenvalues. Um, and in particular, that means in local coordinates, we can think of the function as a saddle at that, in a neighborhood of that critical point. And there will be some number of directions on that saddle that go down, some number of eigen directions of the Hessian. In this case, we'll say D of them. And then there'll be the remaining that go up. And none of them are flat, again, because of the non-degeneracy condition. And we call D the number of negative gradient directions, the, the Morse index. Okay? And so Morse index 0 would be a minimum. Morse index 1 would be a saddle with one direction down and the rest going up. So as an example, we often want to think about height functions. Um, because they're easy to visualize. So here I've drawn the two-dimensional sphere, and my Morse function is mapping a point to its height on this real line. <laughs> and there are two critical points, right? The places where the tangent plane is zero, and those are the minimum and the maximum. Their indices are zero and two. It's a cup and a cap. And one way I can combinatorially represent that structure is by a graph with two nodes. One I'm going to say has index zero, and one has index two, and no edge between them. All right, so uh, there's another, there are many ways that you could actually represent the, uh, the sphere, uh, embed it to, to think of a height function. There's lots of smooth functions on the sphere, right? And, and, and so another very famous one, which my colleague yesterday coined the, the dead mouth five embedding, uh, is, is this one. Uh, so here we have a sphere again, but a different smooth function, still height function, but now there are four critical points. There's a minimum, which is index zero, a saddle, which is index one, and two maxima. And similarly to before, we can talk about this graph where we have two nodes at index two, one at index one, and none at, I'm sorry, one at index zero. And what are these edges? So the idea of these edges is I'm going to draw an edge between two critical points that are in adjacent index, like two and one, or one and zero, uh, for every gradient trajectory that runs between them. So for example, you can see 
the upper left maximum and the saddle have a unique gradient trajectory between them, so there's one edge. Same with from the upper right to that saddle, and then there are actually two gradient trajectories from the saddle to the minimum. One runs on the front, the other runs on the back. There are a lot more gradient trajectories. I've drawn some of them. In fact, you can see there's actually a one manifold with boundary, if you will, of them that kind of interpolate between the broken trajectory that goes from two to one to zero, sort of on the front versus on the back. Uh, and for a reason I'll allude to in another slide or two, that's, that's actually really important, that you can kind of connect in pairs these once broken trajectories. So can you construct uh, like a topological invariant from? That's exactly where we're going. Yeah. yeah. So that's more theory. Any questions about that idea that you can, I basically here just some definitions, okay? You might wonder whether you know, most functions are Morse. The answer is every function you encounter in your life is Morse, unless there's an obvious symmetry acting. Um, Morse functions under a certain topology on the space of functions are an open, dense subset. It means that every function, even if it's not Morse, has a Morse function arbitrarily close nearby. For an example of a function that's not Morse, think about y equals x cubed. Right? Y equals x cubed has this uh, second and third, you know, has a second derivative equal to zero as well. But if you perturb it just a little bit, you'll either get no critical points or you'll get a pair of them that will cancel each other in some sense. And that cancellation is related to algebraic invariants one can construct using these functions. So Morse functions are everywhere. And we'll come back to later how they also might be thought of as loss functions on sufficiently deep and wide neural networks and what that might say about geometric relationships between minima that we could exploit. Sorry, I had one question about the way you constructed that graph. So from the 1 to the 0, you say you can go around the front or around the back. That's right. What's preventing you from doing the same thing between 2 and 1? You can go the, the short way or you can go the long way around. Uh, so the gradient flow here, because it's a height function, is uh, basically taking the fastest way down the mountain, right? Okay. So there is no other trajectory. If you go the other direction from the 2, if you go to the left, you end up at the bottom, at the 0. You don't end up at the 1. So, uh, yeah. So we're only drawing edges between critical points that are an adjacent Morse index. Okay. Two and one, or one and zero. There's a whole one manifold of trajectories between index two and index zero. And in general, the difference between the indices tells us about the dimension of the manifold of gradient trajectories that run between them. But what's nice is when they're an adjacent index, it's a finite number. It's a zero manifold. We can count them. And we can use those counts to define algebraic invariants, which I'll come to next. But here's a very simple algebraic invariant. It's called the Euler characteristic. Um, the Euler characteristic, you might know from when you make like triangulated surfaces. You do like vertices minus edges plus bases. And that number only depends on the shape. It doesn't depend on the way you turned it into triangles. Um, this is a parallel story. You can count the critical points with sign. And the sign is 1 if they're in even index and negative 1 if they're in odd index. So on the left, we're doing 1 minus 0 plus 1. And on the right, we're doing 2 minus 1 plus 1. In either case, we get 2, which is the Euler characteristic of the sphere. So this is the beginning of a story about why there's some interesting topological invariants you could pull out, which are numbers in this case, the Euler characteristic, looking at an arbitrary smooth function on the manifold. Doesn't matter which one you choose, as long as it's Morse, you'll always get that this alternating sum of counts is two, if it's a sphere. Great. So at a certain point, uh, very late in the night, I realized the only way I was going to finish these slides was to <laughs> violate the rule that this couldn't be a board talk and <laughs> draw on a board and take a picture. So here we go. Uh, this is going to be the fanciest algebraic topology of the talk. Um, and it's a lot to take in in one slide. I'll just walk, walk us through it, and um, I'm happy to talk more after. And then there's also a lot of resources I put on our GitHub, like in terms of what textbooks you might look at if you're interested in this stuff. So the fancy way that you construct algebraic invariants of a topological space is called homology. Homology is essentially uh, a series of groups in each dimension whose rank is something to do with the number of holes in that dimension. So the zero homology is to do with connectedness. The first homology is looking for loops that can't be contracted. Um, the second homology is looking for like balls that are missing from your space, that sort of thing. Um, and there's about seven or eight famous ways to build these invariants using different kinds of mathematical technologies. Um, Morse homology is one of them. 
and they all give the same answer. So you may have, if you ever heard of something called simplicial homology or singular homology or check or DRAM or, you know, it goes on and on. These are all isomorphic theories. And in term, and, and, and in fact, they're isomorphic because there are a finite, there's a few axioms which characterize any such theory. And the way you prove these things are the same as you show they satisfy the axioms. The reason we should care about more homology as machine learners, though, is because it actually cares about gradients on like manifolds, which could be, for example, uh, the gradient of a loss function. Or in this case, not a loss function specific. Well, it is a loss function. It's a loss function over the Grassmannian, actually, which is a manifold. So the idea is um, that there is a correspondence between these critical points and these cells that you use to build up your space <coughs> to construct it. So an index zero critical point gives you a point, and that's what you see in the lower left, a zero cell. The index one critical point gives you an interval, and we can glue that interval onto the point, and now we have a circle. These two index two critical points give us what are called two cells. Those are disks, and we can glue those disks onto the circle, and now we've built our sphere. Those ideas were really pushed by people like Rene Tom and Stephen Smale and John Milner quite a while back. 50s, 60s. Um, what was particularly exciting from the point of view of, of thinking about this in machine learning context is the contribution of Ed Witten, who's a fields medalist, but a physicist and a string theorist, you may know. And um, part of this realization is why he won the fields medal. Uh, he actually, he recognized that it wasn't just about building up the space by gluing these cells together, you could encode all that information by counting these gradient trajectories. That would basically be sufficient to understand in a combinatorial way what this space is all about. And so the way you do that is if you have two critical points in adjacent index, x and y, then you define a boundary map, which says that the coefficient of y in the boundary of x is just counting how many gradient trajectories are there from x to y. And it turns out this, this map has the property that if you do it twice, you get 0. The boundary of the boundary is 0. That's a core relationship between these things called chain complexes in algebra, homological algebra, and a geometric fact that the boundary of the boundary of something, you get cancellation and you get 0. We don't have time to go really deep into that, but, but it's a really interesting phenomenon. And it actually it relates to the fact that these two broken trajectories pair up and cancel out in some sense when you do you go twice down, right? OK, so fundamentally, the boundary squared is 0 because the only one manifold with boundary is an interval, and there are two ends, and they have opposite orientation, and they cancel. So for some reason, topology is actually powering this result too. Um, but at a high level, there's more than just this Euler characteristic. There are also this sequence of groups that, when you move to homology, are an invariant of the manifold. In this case, there's a group in degree 0 and a group in degree 1. F here just denotes the field of two elements in order to avoid worrying about orientations and signs. At the end of the day, the point is we can take a space and assign a series of groups. The series of groups only depends on the topology, but it can be understood and constructed from any Morse function at all. And therefore, if you know the topology and you know the groups, then that tells you something about the Morse fu any function, any smooth function. You know that the critical points have to be related in certain geometric ways coming from the gradient. right? And that's that's interesting information to think about um, if you care about gradient descent. OK, so we have our Grassmannian as our, our domain, and we have our Morse function, which is the squared distance from the k-plane to the points. And we can represent that as x minus px, where p is the sort of projection representation of the Grassmannian. And what we want to do now is think about this from this Morse homology or Morse theory perspective. So on the left, we have, again, the lines in R2. In the middle, we're actually looking at that manifold of lines to the origin as a circle. It has a minimum and a maximum under this Morse function. The minimum is achieved at the first principal direction, because that's closest to the data. And the value there is the residual variance, which will be the second singular value squared. The maximum is at the second principal direction. That's farthest from the data. And the residual will be the first singular value squared. So that's our Morse function. We can also think about gradient descent, which in this case is the idea that you could rotate the blue line, the maximum, to the red line in one of two directions. Those are the two gradient trajectories. And I drew them in the circle representation, <coughs> right? Going with the downward gradient. And there's the graph representation 
of the same information. All right, this one's more fun. Now we'll think about lines in three-dimensional space. So the, this is the real projective plane. And the maximum will be the third principal direction. That's farthest from the data. The minimum will be the first principal direction. That's closest to the data. But there's a third uh, critical point. And we know that, actually, because the Euler characteristic of the real projective plane is 1. And so it wouldn't be enough to just have the maximum and the minimum. There has to also be an index 1 critical point. That's going to be a saddle. Not surprisingly, that's going to be the middle principal direction. And the gradient trajectories involve rotating in one of two directions, the green to the blue, or rotating the blue to the red. And on the right, what I'm showing is a representation of the real projective plane as a disk whose boundary points are identified by the antipodal map. And so even though it looks like those blue points and red points occur twice, they're actually the same point under that identification. Unfortunately, um, you need four dimensions to embed this space without it looking crazy. Um, and I only have two on the screen, so we're going to just stare at that disk. <laughs> um, the, the representation of the gradient flow is on that disk, and then the combinatorial representation is on the right. So to convince you that it's not just this stack of, of, of sort of pairs, I'll show you one more example. So this is the Grassmannian of, of two planes in four space. And it has a more interesting topology. Um, so its dimension is four. And the reason is because if you're sitting on a two plane and you want and it's a, it's, it's a, and you want to move to this other two plane, right? You have to pick a direction in your two plane, and then you have to pick a direction that's orthogonal and start rotating. And there's going to be two directions to pick from in your two plane and two directions to pick from in the orthogonal guy. Two times two is four. More generally, the dimension of the Grassmannian is k times m minus k for the same reason. And that formula, you notice, is symmetric under replacing k with m minus k. That's because a k plane has an orthogonal m minus k plane, and so there's a duality there. So the top dimensional maximum is index four. And it corresponds to the bottom two principal directions. The minimum corresponds to the top two principal directions. There's some other critical points in between. And there's a game you can play to figure out the Morse index. But at the end of the day, the graph is on the right. And you can see that this gets kind of interesting. And this is a deeply studied object in mathematics, the structure of these relationships, and so on. Um, great. So what I wanted to then just tell you is the sort of big picture of what's going on here now that you've seen some examples. So we have this loss function. It's a Morse function if and only if the singular values are positive and distinct. There are going to be exactly m choose k critical points. Those will be all choices of k principal k planes. Um, the critical values are sums of eigenvalues of the covariance. So if you're thinking about sort of random data through some probabilistic model, uh, we know exactly in many cases what that spectra look like from random matrix theory and their concentration of measure results. I think of this as like the core toy model for much fancier results from Ising models that people like um, Gerard at NYU have you know, brought to the attention of the deep learning world. The gradient trajectories, as I said, involve rotating one principal direction to another, fixing the rest. And there are always exactly two between any of these adjacent index critical points. And so to a topologist or algebraic topologist, this means that we've constructed the only perfect F2 Morse function in the literature that I could find on the Grassmannian. Um, so that's a technical term, which basically means everything cancels. And we found a Morse function, which has the minimum number of critical points possible. You can't have any fewer. OK. And you could prove these kinds of things by either sort of reducing x to something simpler, like using the SVD and putting the mass of the points just on the fundamental ellipsoid. That's sort of the method by which um, you know, you, you, the mathematician sort of it wakes up in the hotel and sees a fire in the hall, sees a fire extinguisher, and is like, oh, I've solved it, and goes back to bed. Like, you know, I, you could reduce it this way. It's pretty clear you could finish the job from there uh, in some way. Uh, the, the way that I, we actually do it in the paper is reducing it to a harder problem that's already been solved, uh, which is that the body of our paper contains a proof of a result about linear autoencoders, which is exactly the coordinate form of this manifold theorem. And so a commutative diagram turns out to finish the job. That's analogous to the joke where the mathematician you know, watches the physicist boil the water, or like boil the eggs, do all these things in the kitchen. And then it's his turn. And he starts by pouring the water out of the pot and putting it back in the cupboard and says, I reduce it to a problem that's already been solved. <laughs> OK, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, and that is the topology of PCA. Now, 
um, let's come back to linear autoencoders. We had this, this action of the linear group, and it gave us the symmetry that we didn't very like very much. In particular, this, this symmetry means that the principal directions of the, of the fit decoder at the minimum uh, are not well defined because you could modify the decoder by an invertible matrix that wasn't necessarily orthogonal. But if it were orthogonal, then the singular vectors on the outside would not be defined, but on the inside of this picture, they would be because multiplying the SVD by an orthogonal matrix would preserve the rest of the SVD structure. It would preserve the singular values and the K dimension or the M dimensional uh, singular vectors would be preserved. And then we could hope that those singular vectors of the decoder were actually the singular vectors of the data itself, which would be kind of cool. So why might, how might we make that orthogonality happen? Uh, just in terms of time, I'm going to sort of skip this slide. It's motivation for how regularization and orthogonality uh, are very tightly related. Um, but I'll just tell you that what you do. So you regularize. Okay? And you could do it by adding um, some multiple of the composition of the encoder and decoder. Or you could do the more default thing, which is just penalize all the sums of squares of the parameters, which is what we call the sum regularized loss. That sum loss is only invariant with respect to the orthogonal group, which will preserve lengths. And it turns out, when you do that, uh, instead of having the pseudo-inverse relationship, you now have a transpose relationship. And here's a picture showing in training how the encoder and decoder are attracted toward each other in the symmetric sense for the sum loss, but not for the unregularized or product losses. Okay, so the way that we really understood this phenomenon, uh, though, was not empirically, it was just by the other math trick, which is you just take the dead simplest possible case and you try to understand it completely. And it turns out that this is a really interesting case. After you do this case, you basically know what the answer is going to be. Um, and so in these pictures, you have the unregularized loss. There's a saddle at zero, and there are these hyperbola of minima, which correspond to a number in the encoder, and it's reciprocal as the decoder. When you do the product loss, you get this ridge phenomenon. You get a decay of these hyperbola toward the origin. But basically, the picture remains the same. What's, what's really cool is when you do the, the sum loss, regularized loss, which is sort of the standard thing TensorFlow would do for you, there, instead of getting hyperbola, because this transpose relationship holds, the encoder and decoder are free transposes. In the case of, of, uh, of 1D, that just means they have to be equal. And so the numbers you get are on the line w1 equal w2. And so you intersect that with some hyperbola, you get two points. Unless you over-regularize, in which case these two points basically move toward the origin. And as soon as lambda exceeds the, the eigenvalue, uh, you lose all information about uh, that direction. It's a kind of variable selection phenomenon. Yeah. So I, just, I don't quite understand the setup. So it's one-dimensional data, and then you're factorizing a scalar as a product of two scalars. Is that the idea? Yep. But then there's no orthogonality constraint, right? Because you only have one. So here's uh, so we have a visualization thing. Um, these are the equations here. These are you can see just in terms of scalars. And if we look at the unregularized case, we see these hyperbola. Um, we can go to the product case. I mean, like these regularizers were a relaxation of like an orthogonality constraint, but the orthogonality constraint doesn't apply in one dimension, right? We have there is no orthogonality constraint in yeah, the problem. That's like the regularization is like a real orthogonalization thing. is. Uh, sorry, regularization is implicitly tying the weights at the critical points. But can it, can it be seen as a, a way to like approximately enforce some orthogonality? Uh, yeah, it can. OK. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But like the, the motivation for the orthogonality doesn't apply in one dimension. Uh, it does. But there's only one. What, is, what does orthogonality mean in one dimension? So the orthogonal group in, in, in one dimension is plus and minus one. This is why we get exactly two critical points. And the fact that their unit length that the two critical points, uh, sorry, they're not unit length, they're decayed, but, but the fact that they're, um, it's the transpose relationship between the encoder and the decoder, that's, that's effectively where orthogonality is coming in. It, okay. It's a transpose rather than a pseudo inverse. And so what you can see here is if we make the, if we make the uh, lambda less than the data x, then we should be able to get, uh, or bigger. bigger, sorry. What am I doing wrong? 
Hmm? Why do this one? I want to get the two minima. Oh, the other way around the smaller. Yeah. So, there we go. Okay, so there are two minima. So when lambda is smaller than x, we have two minima. As we increase lambda, as it passes x, they cancel basically toward the origin, and we're left with just one minima. All right, so that's the phenomenon of the sum regularized loss. And go back here. And now I'll give you the complete characterization, like a smooth parameterization of all critical points of, this, of all of these problems. So all three losses, effectively, you choose a index set of principal directions at most k of them, so of L directions. So, so some of these critical points are low rank, like the origin, rank zero. And then in the first two loss functions, we'll choose a k by L matrix whose uh, columns are independent. In the sum regularized case, we want columns that are orthonormal. And I've written down the form of the how that parameterizes the loss landscape. And, and you'll see a kind of ridge regression phenomenon in the middle case. And in the bottom case, notice that when lambda is bigger than an eigenvalue, then you get a negative number raised to 1 half. In other words, real solutions disappear into complex land. And that's <coughs> what's going on. Um, and that's very much like principal uh, probabilistic PCA, if you think about it. When you, when you do probabilistic PCA, uh, if your noise is bigger than your signal, you lose all information about that direction. Um, so here's some empirical demonstration where the curves are theoretical from those formulas, and the dots are training on MNIST or something similar, and they just land empirically right on the curves. So that's kind of nice. Um, and here's a formal relationship between the probabilistic PCA model and a sort of Bayesian formulation of the sum loss, which you can think of as a, as a sort of log posterior, right? Um, and and the, these are different models. They are different models, but their critical points are basically are, are very closely related by this reparameterization, which is a kind of whitening. Um, in particular, the amount of regularization lambda in the autoencoder model corresponds to the amount of noise in the sort of feature space that you add in in the probabilistic PCA model. In the variable selection sense. Yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the variable selection sense. Yeah. Okay. So now, in the last little bit, just okay, so I have another question. So yeah, like so, there's other situations in machine learning where you want to, you have some like op, some prior belief that something is low rank. It's like a matrix completion problem or something. Yeah, but that like making like factorizing something so like subject to that constraint is hard. So yeah. you relax it by saying, okay, I'm going to like penalize the singular values of some matrix or something, right? Yeah. So you have like the it's like in the same way that the the zero one. Um, like some for like uh, some sparse coding or something, right? You you use like an L1 norm. Mm -hmm. um, so here you like committed to some rank K factorization, but couldn't you have taken like couldn't you have done a like a full rank factorization and then push the singular values down? Like you you, you, you sort of you like yeah. So the K is an upper bound, values. right? Because if you don't know a priori what the eigenvalues are, then you won't know what lambda is going to kill, right? And and so and so what you're going to get when you fit this is basically all the eigen directions whose eigenvalues are exceeding your regularization constant, but you won't know a priori what those are. You could estimate them. Um, and, and, and so I think of K as sort of an upper bound on how many directions you might find. Um, does that, does but but in terms of computational order? complexity, if you do the full rank thing, you're holding a lot more parameters around than is worth it if you only care about so many uh, directions. And you'll get faster convergence the bigger the eigenvalue is. But, but isn't like gradient descent in the full thing subject to some like, you know, regularizer that penalizes the full rank? Like this, the, the single values of the full rank matrix going to be like a more well posed optimization problem than like committing to some low rank factorization. I'm not sure. Because it seems like one of those is going to be uh, like more non convex than the other, right? Because you isn't this for like basic matrix factorization and like you. So this is a yeah. perfectly. I mean, even the autoencoder model is a. It's what's called a more spot function. There are these directions that are sort of zero once you have these symmetries acting, but you're not going to get stuck. You're going to make it all the way down. It's strictly saddle. Um, so it satisfies the kinds of things you want when you're doing gradient descent. Sufficiently small learning rate, you will you'll end up at the minima basically with probability one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. In the linear case, we know that. Yeah. Sure. There, the are, there are also case. In the linear case. Right. There okay. are also these so, results so about like um, yeah. uh, these these relatively recent results like no spurious uh, <laughs> local minima and matrix factorization and stuff like this is. This is something that 
we all were worried about for a while, but it seems like it's actually not that big a deal. For, for linear autoencoders, it's not, and this is a kind of toy model of matrix factorization, so it's not surprising that these other models would have similar phenomenon despite having non-convex loss landscapes. Um, what gets really interesting is when you introduce boundary, like if you're doing non-negative matrix factorization, suddenly now there are all kinds of local minima, but they're all in the boundary, right? So we can get into that in a second, but yeah. And you don't need to make some assumptions about like the underlying factorization structure, like the columns, like the, the true columns or like RIP or something like that. I'm not making any, I mean, the like, model is what I said. that Matt's invoking, don't you have to make some assumptions? Uh, I, I, I'll admit I'm not familiar enough yeah. with no, no, I think it's I think it's just, you know, least squares matrix factorization. Yeah. Um, okay, well. it's, it's, it's a statement about the low. It's a statement about the minima. It's not a statement about the um, it's not a statement about like it's not like an RIP kind of statement where it's like if, you know, subject to some assumptions on the data, you will recover, you know, the truth or whatever. It's it's a statement about the optimization problem. OK, cool. Great. So now I'm going to present uh, a few potential next steps for this work uh, that I thought might be potentially interesting to people here. Um, and I'll preface this with, I got off the academic train um, in part so I could just not give a shit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can run with these if they're interesting. You can ignore them if they're not. We can work together. We cannot. It's all good. Um, but I think there might be something here worth, worth discussing. Uh, and here is a nice photo with Cotton and, and Matt from, I think, 2000, I don't know, 15 or 16. Clearly, this is when JAX was, was invented. <laughs> uh, if you look at the things on the board, it actually... It's not entirely implausible, but of course, Matt's been thinking about these things forever. <laughs> All right, uh, great. So let's talk about them. So the first one is an algorithm. So we definitely like eigenvectors. I mean, page rank is useful. Uh, and so anytime you can write down you know, a potentially new algorithm for computing eigenvectors, um, the first thing you worry about is that there's no way in hell it's new, because what the hell, but, uh, but then, you put it out there, and a bunch of people tell you that they can't find any reference for such a thing. And eventually, you become convinced that whether or not it's new, it's at least not well known, and maybe it's actually new. So I mean, all this is is gradient descent on the regularized linear autoencoder. And the only thing you got to do at the end is uh, you get that W2, that decoder, and you get its singular vectors, and you uh, you know back out the singular values that are bigger than lambda by unshrinking. So there is an SVD algorithm. And it can be implemented here. It's, this, is, this is like the whole thing. It's NumPy. But you could do it in TensorFlow in about the same number of lines. And then you could use all sorts of fancy things to try to accelerate the convergence. Now, one thing you should definitely do is uh, tie the weights explicitly. So the point of our results is that if you regularize, you don't have to actually tie the weights. They'll, that'll happen for free at the critical points. But um, we also show that if you tie the weights a priori, that is, you, 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 you say that W1 and W2 must be transposes, uh, then it still gives you the same exact critical landscape. So we can have half the parameters, and we can do this update. And uh, this turns out to actually be a regularized version of something called Oja's rule, Oya's rule in uh, neuroscience, which is about how the brain learns representations. Um, and it doesn't seem to have been commented on before, the idea that you should regularize it. But when you regularize it, this magical transpose things happen. And uh, that means you actually can learn the directions, not just the subspace. So you must know, a priori, you must assume a priori some like length scales for the problem or something. Like that alpha is like a learning rate that depends on a lot of. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what I'm presenting here is I'm telling you an optimization problem that could be approached in all sorts of ways. You could do the gradient descent I first showed. Probably shouldn't. You should probably do the second one because there's half the parameters and it converges faster, as you can see in this picture. You could also do exact updating, right? You could. It's a convex problem. If you fix W1 to find the best W2, and you could go back and forth like you might with NMF, that turns out to take fewer duration, fewer iterations. We've implemented all these basic versions in a few lines of Python. Here are some graphs. Um, the thing that I think is most interesting is if, if you think about using stochastic gradient descent and you're subsampling data right, um, with each iteration to compute some approximate gradient, and, and, and you iterate and you eventually reduce your problem to a much smaller problem, right? instead of having a m by n matrix where n could be millions, you have an m by k matrix where k is like 10, and then the rest is free basically from there. right? So it has a flavor that's very similar to randomized SVD, which is more or less a state of the art. 
for computing SVD, where you subsample and compute a small gram matrix, take its eigen decomposition. We have no idea whether this is going to be competitive. It's absolutely not competitive with SVD as, as implemented in four lines of Python. Um, but a potential collaboration is, you know, this can be shoved onto the deep learning stack with like three lines of code. And then there's all sorts of tricks you can play to ask how quickly can this be made to converge. And I wonder if we play those tricks, could it be competitive with randomized SVD? I have no idea, but if the complexity is similar, then I would expect the answer is yes. I haven't, we haven't really gone down this rabbit hole yet, but I think it's exciting to try. Okay. Um, so the second of the three is what I'm calling Morse ensembling, which feels like it should be combined into one word it's called more assembling. Uh, and, and here's the idea. So there's been a lot of interest in ensemble methods for fitting deep neural networks lately because they generalize better uh, and they do well on benchmarks, but they come at a cost. Every time you retrain the model, you, you have linear, you know, increase in computational expense and you have to remember all these parameters. Uh, so, so some folks like last year at NeurIPS, they, they came up, they came up with ways of, of, once you find one minima, can you efficiently find more? And so fast geometric ensembling is a great example of this. And that's what I've drawn in the lower right, this idea that you find a minimum and then you increase the temperature, bounce around some, come back down. It's very much like MCMC. You hope to find a, a few more minima more efficiently than you would if you retrain from the beginning. Okay, so that's an empirical paper and they're very excited that if you have two minima, they show that you can find a path in the parameter space, not a straight line, but a kind of piecewise linear or quadratic looking path that has the property that as you move along that path in parameter space, your loss function stays very low. So this had to happen for on theoretical grounds. So for two reasons, one, because of the work that's probabilistic from Lacoon and, and, and um, Gerard and others, which says that in a sufficiently deep wide network with random data, all the minimum are basically the same height and the index one saddles are basically a little bit above that, and the index two saddles are basically a little bit above that. And so in particular, what we learned earlier is that because RP, our domain, is a connected space, all of these index one minima actually are forced by algebraic topology to be related to each other through these kinds of gradient trajectories that start at a minimum, go up to an index one saddle, and come back down. That forms a connected bipartite graph between the minima and the index one saddles. It's like moving along the ocean floor. So we know that has to be true, and we also know you don't have to go very high because of the probabilistic uh, concentration of measure results, right? So that had to work, and it does, and that's exciting. But in practice, the way they implement it is this uh, sort of learning rate cycling because it's more efficient. So I think if we're going to do ensembling, at some point we have to care not just about quantity but the quality of <clears throat> the minima. If they're all basically in the same region, we're going to use a lot of memory and a lot of computation to do our predictions. And the benefit might not be as big as if we could find a lot of minima that are really far from each other in the basin of minima. And so what I'm proposing is the idea that we leverage the fact that as we do gradient descent, we see these times when we kind of slow down our descent and then it speeds up and slows down. And those are times when we're near saddles. And if we're near a saddle, there are a bunch of works which argue that we can look at local information and figure out which way to get out of the saddle. But why just one way? If we know we're near a saddle, why not go both ways out of the saddle? Or if it's an, if it's an I don't know, D index saddle, there's sort of a D, there are D eigenvectors. We have two D directions we can keep descending, right? Or we could just, you know, pick some direction that one of these algorithms gives and, but also go in the opposite direction. And so this is a completely recursive <laughs> procedure. It requires no new code. Um, but the idea would be you descend basically halfway. And if you find yourself near a saddle, then you bifurcate your descent and you keep doing that halfway, halfway. The amount of compute is logarithmic. The number of minima you find is linear. And if you want, you could augment this by then bouncing those minima around. But I would suspect that these would actually be more spread out than if you just go down once and then start bouncing around. And in a, in a world where like eventually the compute to run all these parallel predictions and store all these parameters is going to get really big, we might want fewer, but have them be higher quality. So this is, this is an idea that uh, I think would be fun to, to try. And I know there are people in this room who probably in 30 minutes could implement first version, um, right? Jasper, for example. <laughs> okay. So uh, quick question about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, does that 
sort of, does that top topological result imply that if you did gradient ascent from a local minimum mm -hmm. and uh, that that would be right, that, that you would go, that you would wind up going to one of, going back to one of these saddles or whichever. No, because came from? when you start at the minimum, right, any direction oh, yeah, okay. you move sure. is a gradient. You don't know a priori which one's going to take you to the saddle. Uh, okay, yeah, but so, yeah. Uh, but if you if you perturbed yourself a little bit, so you weren't at the critical point, right? Nobody's ever at a critical point. Nobody ever actually trains their their neural networks to to convergence. It, right. So you could you could go backward, but I but my feeling is on the way down, you know, when you're near a saddle for the same reason, you slow down. You might as well already start bifurcating then. This is, yeah, yeah, this absolutely. Is, this is sort of like a, a stochastic shotgun MCMC applied to. Uh, you know, neural net training. You know, if you go in the direction of the principal Hessian eigenvector, yeah. do you not then get to a... Could you get to the same minimum? You, no, from a minimum, do you then... Because if you pick the right path, then you get to a saddle point. And it seems like that's kind of the right way to pick the correct path. So, so the pro yeah, so, so you have this canonical coordinate form and local coordinates, but you're not given those local coordinates, right? That's, let, let's, let's come back to it after. The answer is you don't really know which way to go. There are ideas related to... Uh, computational chemistry, which involve um, kind of, uh, you have like, you're thinking about stretching a band and then trying to push the band to get more and more like a gradient path. Super computationally expensive, but it will find for you, you know, the path between two minima that is actually the gradient path. It's just too, it's just too expensive. That's, that's the problem. It's called elastic band. Yeah. All right. Since I only have a minute, let's, let's talk about brain because we're at Google brain. Um, so the premise here is that, uh, well, actually, I should say we, we sent this, we put this paper online, and we poked a few people with similar work, and 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 uh, Yasha Bengio responded and said, actually, this transpose result has has implications for computational neuroscience, which we did not realize ahead of time. And here's here's the story. Um, so deep neural networks, in terms of their prediction, are modeled on primate visual cortex with these neurons and feed forward and nonlinearities and linearities. And the way we train a deep neural network in a computer is by backpropagation. And in that model, the weights going forward are transposed when you go backward. They're symmetric because it's the same neurons. In the brain, neurons are unidirectional. So you have axons that go sort of deeper layers. You have axons that go the other way, but they're different neurons. And so what's called the weight transport problem or the symmetric weight problem is if the brain were to implement backprop as its learning algorithm, why the hell would the neurons going forward and the neurons going backward have symmetric weights? Like what would cause that to happen? Because it seems like a necessary condition for backprop to be biologically plausible. And so while we don't have like any kind of, like we just have the beginning of a story here. Um, the story is that if you imagine that you have a feed forward net, but there's sort of auto encoders happening between layers to preserve information. And if you have regularization, which might be natural from an energy conservation perspective to not have weights that are too big, then it could be that under some iterative procedure, there is a forcing mechanism that wants the weights going forward and the weights going backward to be symmetric by the results in this paper as sort of the fundamental toy idea. And, and so um, that's basically something that Daniel went and implemented in PyTorch because you, it's hard in TensorFlow to like create things that aren't actually just running back propagation. And it does well on MNIST and it will be interesting to see how that relates to other work that suggests that sort of random weights kind of work sometimes too. We don't know. So there's an exploration here to understand this better. Can we simulate that problem? And then Good there's a final problem. slide, and it says thanks, and some links, and you guys will get the slides. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>